I apologize to the people that um, that started at eleven, and um, we're going to try this again. And I don't know. Somebody said I had it at written eleven somewhere, so I certainly didn't mean to do that. And uh, I just got a message that somebody was already logged on 11. So then I was like, oh, no, I got to get on there. I've been so busy this morning. So I just started class and then, um, yeah, got all mixed up. So um, we are going to get started and I hope everybody can hear. Um, and we can get moving. This shouldn't take too long to get started, but what I want to do Sorry, I'm typing a message to somebody who's trying to figure out why they can't hear. Um, Okay, let me, um, get started. And we want to look at, again, the NACI Code of Ethical Conduct, look at a project that we have that is coming up, and then two different subjects that it are coming up, child health and child obesity. We know from the ethical code of conduct that we are responsible to these different people and you have been working on those through your ethical uh, scenarios. And we have a framework that helps us to decide and make decisions using the NACI code of conduct by looking at the different uh, conflicts, deciding who we're responsible to. And that can be problematic sometimes to decide, is it just the child? Is it the family too? Um, are colleagues involved? Um, is it the community? Brainstorm different solutions, use some ethical finesse here and there, look for the guidance in the NACI code. What does it tell us that we should do and decide on a course of action? And I was telling everybody earlier that we need to remember that the parents need to be involved. So when you are thinking about a decision that needs to be made, you should always include the family or if it's just a mother or father or grandparents or whoever the guardians are, include them in the decision-making for the child. Now, I know there are times when something like child abuse, then you can't say, oh, well, I, you know, I'm going to let you abuse the child, you know, some days. 
you know, you obviously can't say that, but you can decide, for example, with the child who was wearing the jacket that we knew was too hot for him and he was getting overheated, you know, sit down and maybe you can come to some type of compromise with the family instead of immediately telling the family, no, you just can't, this child is getting too hot. You cannot, he cannot wear this jacket. That wasn't really a life or death situation, I don't think. Um, it didn't seem to be that that bad. I mean, obviously he was getting hot, um, but I think that if you sat down with the family and you already had made a good relationship with the family, I think you could probably come up with a good solution together. And you could show them some guidance from the NACI Code of Ethical Conduct and then come up with a good solution. Many of you had really good solution solutions from your side of um, your viewpoint as a teacher and from the parent's viewpoint. So you came up with a couple of different solutions based on both sides. So you were looking at both, both the parent's viewpoint and the teacher's viewpoint. So I thought that was really good. But you definitely should, you know, add that into your solution that you're looking at um, everybody trying to get together and come up with a solution. Some people already wrote some answers in here. What is one thing that you learned about NACI Code of Conduct um, that was really important? And if I go back in the chat, if anybody wants to add anything else, you can. But one thing that somebody put that's important to know which principles and standards apply to who, to who since, you know, the community or the families or children or, or what. So it's important to know that. Um, somebody else put it's important because it helps teachers figure out what we can and can't do about certain problems, and it helps us to protect the children. And I think that those were really good answers. Um, those are important things about the NACI Code of uh, Ethics. Can you think of anything else that you think is really important about the NACI? Code of Ethics. Yes, it does. We get very clear guidelines. I agree with that. It's a lot to look at. Yeah. Definitely. It's good for us as an educator to give us that guide to go by. So, you know, I, I agree with everything that you're saying. It is really helpful. Yeah. For those sticky situations when you don't really know an answer of what you should do. So what would you like to know more about the NACI Code of Ethics? Is there anything else that is still, you know, you're still wondering about, you're not really sure about. Now, that's a good, a good uh, question. And it, it is used nationally and internationally too. Uh, there is, it's more nationally than internationally, but they created it with a team of highly qualified people um, in early childhood who have a lot of knowledge and they used a lot of research. So it's based on research and it was actually revised and it is revised, I think, every five years. Um, and that is also a really good question. Whose morals is it based on? 
That's a really good question. And what they try to base it on is more about research. And so they looked at what research said about children and what we should do, not necessarily what somebody does in France or what somebody does in India or what somebody does in Germany, but, you know, what the research has done, has been done. And they use research, not just from the United States, but research from other countries too. So um, it, it, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So is there anything that's really confusing to you? Yes, that is really good. <laughs> that is a great question because that happens, I think, um, more often than you would imagine. It can happen and it probably does happen. And even in Greenville, because you think, well, Greenville, you know, when do we have a lot of difference in culture? Well, we do. We have a lot of industry that is based in other countries. We have people from Michelin that come and they are from other countries. And we have people that come from GE and people from, um, uh, oh shoot, I forgot the other uh, company I was thinking about. But we have a lot of people who um, come from these different industries and they live in Greenville and they have they come with different beliefs about how children should be raised. And so a lot of times there, there is some, some confusion. And so then you have to think about, you know, how are we going to handle these situations? And that's when those conversations with the parents and then when you can make some kind of compromise. Um, and no, it's not required. It's definitely not required, but the centers who are accredited by NACI, they are expected to follow the ethical code of conduct. So if you get your accreditation, then you should, but it's definitely not required. Um, and so if you don't have a NACI accreditation, you certainly can use it. Nobody, you know, it's out there. It's, you know, free for anybody to access. So you don't have to be a NACI accredited center to use it. It's there. It's free for anybody to use. And that's, you know, NACI gives a lot of resources out that people can use. <clears throat> so how will it help you as a teacher? Even if your center that you work at in the future is not even a NACI accredited center, which there are not very many accredit NACI accredited centers in Greenville. If you go on the NACI website and you can look at any state, at any city, um, and you can find where the NACI accredited centers are. And you can do the same thing with colleges. You can find out which colleges are NACI accredited. And so you can um, look up and find it if you want your child to go to a center that is NACI accredited, you can find, but you will be surprised there are not that many. And it doesn't mean that a center is not good because becoming a NACI accredited center is extremely expensive. So some centers just can't afford to do it. Okay, good. I like those answers. Good answers. Yes. Yes. Those are great answers that I think those are things that it will help you with as you 
um, if you are a teacher now or you're going to become a teacher. So um, let's move forward past that. That was just sort of a review. And we'll ha you'll have a few more scenarios that you'll be working on. Um, and I know you'll be glad when those are over, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but let's look at this one of these projects we have coming up. It's called Becoming a Professional, and it's more of a paper that you're going to write. We've been doing some discussion questions, and you probably see my note that says, keep in mind, this is probably going to be useful to you when you do your Becoming a Professional project. So think about your answer that you wrote for this discussion question. Look at some of the answers that some of your classmates wrote because you may need to use some of their answers in your paper. So it's okay to take some of their answers out of the discussion board. It's there for you to use. So that's why I'm getting you to do some of these discussions ahead of time. So it gives you ideas for this paper that you're gonna be working on. So you can see we have, and I hope I updated this uh, due date. I'm not sure. Um, this PowerPoint, I think I updated it, um, but I've got November 22nd. That may not be right, but I think, I'm pretty sure I updated it, but basically you're gonna write a paper on how to become a professional. So when you are a teacher, you are considered a professional in your field. So this counts as 20% of your final grade. So I would say that is extremely important. So if you do not do this, you could lose. Thank you, Tiara. She says it's due November 20th. So I did not update this PowerPoint. Um, so it, let's say you made 100% on everything else in this class and you did not do this project. Your grade would go all the way down to an 80%. So you would barely make a B in, in here. But that's only if you made 100% on everything else. So if you didn't, you could easily make a C or a D uh, just by not doing this paper. Um, but you definitely want to try to make a good grade. So I um, divided this paper into three parts. So in the first part, you're going to describe why it's important to join a professional organization. So, you know, we've talked about that, right? We've done discussion on that. And then you're going to explain your philosophy of teaching. You've done that probably in another class. And if you haven't, this is a good time to get started working on that. And then you're going to talk about your professional development plan. So when you finish here, Greenville Tech, if you become a teacher, you still have to take training and classes. Even for me, I'm a um, licensed teacher in South Carolina. I have to take so many classes to continue to hold my license in South Carolina. If um, I don't, I don't, I won't be able to continue to hold my license. So you're going to make a plan. What are you going to do after you graduate? How are you going to get your professional development? So this breaks down the paper. So we're going back to part one, the importance of joining a professional organization. So in this part, you, you probably are going to have a couple of paragraphs, I would say. And this might be a page or a page and a half, maybe even two pages. I would think at least a page or a page and a half. So think about, you know, what are the benefits of joining an early childhood association? 
Remember we went to the different websites and we looked at all the different benefits that they gave us for, you know, sometimes you got discounts on different things and you got free magazines and journals and things like that. And you got to, you know, you got to go to conferences and you got, you know, free resources on their websites and all that kind of stuff. So right about all those kind of benefits, you get to, you know, meet up with other people and you get to be on different blogs and all that kind of stuff. Then talk about why it's important to join and keep a membership in an early childhood organization. You know, why, why should I even join an organization like that? You know, what, why is that important to me? Well, you know, think about, you know, it gives us a voice. When we want to, you know, I think that when you work in a, every teacher makes low pay. So when we join into a membership, like an organization like this, then we make a bigger voice, right? And so this organization can help advocate for us to make higher pay. But if we're just one person and we show up at the state house, it doesn't make that much difference, right? But if we have a big group of people, you know, and we have 50,000 people showing up, Nacy, you know, it makes a big difference for us to show up. And so we have a bigger voice by joining and we can advocate for those things that we want, not just for us, but even for children and for families and things like that. Um, so there are those kind of reasons that we can join and maintain our membership. Um, but we also get to, you know, collaborate with others that are in the same field, learn from others, get ideas about teaching um, and activities and things like that. And also think about our responsibility to continue to learn and to be collaborative or to work together with other people. So make sure that as, as you're writing this, that you're showing that it's important that we uh, collaborate with other teachers, that we work together with other teachers. And it's not just the ones that are in our school, but, you know, teachers across, you know, everywhere, you know, that we, we get on blogs and that we get on, you know, um, for me, I like to get on social media and I follow teachers who have really good ideas and um, they give me super ideas. And then if I have an idea, I put those ideas up. I have my own page on social media and I put up ideas and I share ideas. And that's the way that I collaborate with people all across the world. And it's really fun to do that. And you learn a lot. And so you also need to talk about advocacy. We really haven't gotten to that part as much yet. We talked about it a little bit, but you want to talk about how it's important that you advocate for um, for yourself as a professional and other teachers, and you advocate for children and families. So make sure that you understand that part of your job as a teacher is to continue to advocate for the field of early childhood, that you should um, do what you can to strengthen and um, continue to work towards the good of early childhood. So 
um, that's a lot of stuff, I know. <laughs> um, and I probably said more than what you need to put in your paper, but just I'm just throwing some my ideas out there just to kind of give you some ideas. Hopefully you took some notes on that, but I'm recording this. So if you want to go back and look at it, you can. And then part two is think about your professional um, context and research-based knowledge when you're do writing your philosophy. So where is it coming from? Um, if you've taken 237 methods and materials, you know that there are different theorists. Um, I'm trying to think what other class you talk about theorists in. Um, you might have some theorists that you follow that you like Montessori or Reggio or Piaget or somebody like that. You know, think about where is your philosophy coming from? Where does your knowledge come from? Thank you. 131, 132, language arts, math, and science. So these are some classes where if you've taken those, you might have gotten some information. So if you haven't taken any of those classes, then you may want to look online and look and see, you know, look at teaching philosophies and look at um, where is some information or something that you think um, sounds like something that you would um, want you, your teaching to follow. You know, play is really popular right now. The, the um, getting back to play is really important. You know, looking into play would be something. So, you know, maybe look at that and look at, you know, somebody who's doing research on play and talk about that. But just, you know, bring in somebody who's a researcher or something and, you know, basically it's kind of name dropping, <laughs> you know, putting in somebody's name that you you like to follow or like to be like, that somebody who's a researcher. And then um, talk about uh, reflections on your values of teaching. So just kind of, this one's kind of hard to explain, but, um, you know, talk about your own, you know, like, what do you, what do you value? What's important to you? Maybe play is important to you. Maybe hands-on learning is important to you. I mean, what do you think is really important in your own teaching style? What is, you know, maybe you like to um, spend a lot of time outdoors. That's really important for you as a teacher. That's, that's getting to be really important, especially since COVID happened. Um, I just bought a book and it's all about how to do all outdoor learning. And it's really intriguing. And then tell how you will um, influence children's lives. You know, how are you going to be um, in a good way, you know, in a positive way? You know, how are you, how is the things that you're going to do help children? And go back to the code of ethical conduct. And you don't have to write a whole lot, but tell, you know, what, you know, you don't want to go through the whole code and write everything, but just kind of tell a little bit about what are your responsibilities to children? What are your responsibilities to families? What are your responsibilities to colleagues? What are your responsibilities to the community? And then this, this whole thing is sort of your philosophy of teaching. So, but this is based on more of the code. So you may have written a philosophy in another class, 
like diversity in that class where you write a philosophy, but that's based on, um, on more on diversity. So this one's based more on the code of ethical conduct. So um, it's it's a little bit different. Um, so I know you might think, well, we've ri I've written one in another class, but this one is a little different. <clears throat> So I guess the reason why I'm telling you this right now is because you could start this now and start writing some of this. And then um, you don't have all this to write, you know, all at one in one night or something, because that would be really hard. And then the last part you want to tell the details about how you're going to continue to learn. Um, you know, what are you going to take webinars? Are you going to um, go to conferences? Are you going to learn from other teachers? Are you going to go to trainings that are in the local area? Are you going to continue your education and get another degree? You know, talk about different specific learning opportunities that you could do. Um, some of the, like, um, the, uh, oh, what is it called? I can't think of the name of it, but it was one of the, the South Carolina thing in Greenville it was on on um, when we looked up different places but the um, one of the Greenville places they had learning opportunities that you could go to um, you could even talk about that so you could go back to that week that we talked about different um, like we talked about NACI and we talked about the South Carolina um, Early Childhood um, Association, and then there was a Greenville one that we talked about. Um, they have learning opportunities, and then um, no, it was called something else. Tacoa, I can't remember the name of it. Um, and then, so if you're going to do all this learning. Because you have to, because if you want to work in a center, you have to have um, so many different hours. Um, so if you get this hour, these different hours of learning, how is this going to influence the work that you do with children? How is this going to make you a better teacher? How will the children learn? from the teach that the learning that you do. Because when you learn things, it should impact children. You shouldn't go to a tra training and then you're like, okay, I went to that training. And then you never bring anything back to the classroom. You should always think of at least one thing you're gonna bring back to the classroom and try to implement that into the classroom. So Obviously, you don't need to talk about something specific, but just think about how will it impact the children? How would that learning impact the children? So that's a lot to write about. And it, that's why it's a big chunk of your, of your grade, because it is such a big project. And um, we use this project as a NACI key assessment. So NACI gets your score on what everybody makes on this. It's a really important project for us. So we grade it with a, a, a special rubric. And um, just to finish, I would put a short summarizing paragraph and obviously, we're, we're always looking to make sure you're using, you know, good grammar, correct spelling, that kind of stuff. And 
when we talk about tech technological literacy, that's basically, you know, that you know how to use the computer and format everything appropriately. And, you know, obviously there should be, it shouldn't just be one long page. It should be divided in paragraphs here and there. Um, so just remember some of those things you learned in English literature. You don't have to cite anything. Um, no, it's it's probably going to be more than two pages, I would say. So any other questions about that? And if you if you're in um Blackboard, go to the assignment area and you can see it's our, it's up there. So it has all those directions there. But I would say, you know, since we've done some of the discussions, go back to some of those discussions, see what people have written, get some ideas from those and begin to write. So you don't have to make up everything by yourself. Um, I, you know, that's the reason I did discussions, like I said, ahead of time and for you to get some ideas. All right, well, if you think of a question, put it in the chat or, um, you know, you can say it out loud. So let's look at child health and uh, childhood obesity for a minute. Not it won't take a long time. But we'll look at it for a minute. Um, metabolic rate has been looked at as a cause of obesity. Your metabolism is basically how do you expend energy for your normal resting functions? And it's accountable for 60% of your total energy um, for just basically sitting around. So what the research has shown is people who are obese have lower uh, metabolic rates. So but researchers think that the difference in metabolic rates are not entirely responsible for the rising rates of obesity. The literature or the research investigated factors behind poor, uh, poor diet, and they offered a lot of insight into how parental factors may impact obesity obesity in children. They said that children learn by the way parents model and their peers that they hang out with. So um, what the parents are eating and what their peers are eating. Also, the availability of healthy food is a key to developing preferences and like or dislike of food. Mealtime structure is really important. So families who eat together typically consume more healthy foods. Families who eat out or watch TV while eating is associated with a higher intake of fat. Um, parental eating feeding style was found to be very significant. The uh, researcher found that authoritative feeding, uh, that means like uh, determining which foods are um, offered, um, is associated with 
well, authoritative food, babies, authoritative feeding is associated with positive cognitions about healthy foods and healthier intakes. Um, restriction of junk food is associated with increased desire for unhealthy food and higher weight, which seems weird because you would think, well, if you limit the junk food, they wouldn't, they wouldn't want it. So, um, I think that that's kind of weird of that kind of finding. It says that um, teenagers associate junk food with pleasure, independence, and convenience. And they uh, think healthy food is considered odd. So the research says that we should change the meanings of food and social perceptions of eating behaviors. The National Task Force on Obesity says we should tax unhealthy food options and provide incentives for distributing inexpensive healthy foods and enhance healthy eating and more physical activity. says fast food has been linked with obesity. I think we probably know that. Um, we said, and it says that two parents are typically working outside the home, so they often eat out because it's convenient and inexpensive. But fast food restaurants can um, often contain high number of calories and very low nutritional values. And one other study found that sugary drinks are another factor that is a potential um, contributor to obesity. And it's not just soda, it's also um, things such as uh, fruit juices. Even though they're healthy, um, it's still a lot of calories. And, you know, I remember when I was young, we really didn't have snack foods, but snack foods are one of those things that contribute to um, obesity. We have a lot of snacks. People are snacking a lot more. Portion sizes are something else that is contributing. Um, you know, when you go out to eat, there's a lot bigger, much bigger um, portions than we ever used to have. Um, screen use, the TV, the computer, cell phones, laptops, all those kind of things. Um, so it's causing children not to go outside, not to play, um, having um, places that are not safe to play have also contributed so that children cannot go outside and um, you know, play. When I was young, we used to um, be outside all the time, and my mother didn't even know where we were half the time, but um, my father was in the military, so a lot of times we were on military bases, and it was, you know, perfectly safe to be anywhere, um, so we didn't have any problems with that. <clears throat> Let's see if there's anything else. But I think most of these things that we already knew about, and I don't think it's really anything that is, you know, that shocks us about any of this information. I mean, I think it's, it's 
you know, things that we would, you know, that we could tell, you know, you don't have to do research to tell us this, this, this stuff. But if you look at these diseases and conditions, these are some things that children who are obese um, can actually have either when they're children, teenagers, or adults. So that's a lot of conditions. I mean, it's kind of scary to think about. And here are some of the things that I named. And it, it is difficult. It's really difficult. Now that my children are older, they're out of the house and um, it's just my husband and me. And so we're home and we cook almost every night. And um, it's easy because I don't have crying children. I don't have anybody hanging on my leg and screaming. I don't have to take anybody to football or cheerleading or, you know, I don't have to run around or pick anybody up. And we have time to like, you know, cook and chop up food and, you know, have a healthy diet and stuff. And, you know, when I was a mother, it was, it was a whole different thing. You know, it's easier just to go to the Little Caesars and grab a pizza, you know, and that was our food. So I know what it was like. It, it's very difficult. So here are some tips that they say for us to give families to help them to have more healthy um, diets for their children. Um, to get more vegetables and fruit and grain and um, help children to stay more active and get them to drink more water instead of sugary drinks. And, you know, sometimes in our, if we have a newsletter or if we have a Facebook page for a classroom or, um, or whatever, we can, put up I, I wouldn't put all this stuff up at one time but as a teacher maybe one tip per week or per month or whatever um because all this at one time is too much but you know giving a tip every once in a while or having a little calendar you know this week try to you know, ride your bike for such and such amount of time or something like that, or, you know, try to limit the amount of time watching TV or, you know, this kind of thing. I, it surprised me um, when I was doing my master's degree, I did um, a thing on children's sleep habits and their correlation with their grades and I did on fifth graders so the parents were involved and um, I was trying to figure out if children who got the proper amount of sleep had better had better grades and I was surprised how many children did not um, have a bedtime and the parents were very honest on the survey that I gave out. And they said, mm -hmm, we don't, we don't have a bedtime. And these were 20 to 10 year olds, I guess. And um, it was really shocking to me. So, um, you know, some children I know go to bed with an iPad um, and those kind of things, and you don't know how long they stay up with it, or they have TV on, and that kind of thing, and it may not be monitored, and I know that's an easy way to get children to stay in the bed, and I, those kind of things, so I understand. I was a mother, um, so, you know, but tips we can give families and kind of share with them 
because when children do not get enough sleep, then we as teachers have to deal with that, right? Uh, so, um, but anyway, my study did find that children who got the proper amount of sleep did have better grades. So um, it was a, uh, you know, just what you would think. Okay, so that's the end of that for today. And I'm sorry about all the confusion. Um, I hope that that helped to explain anybody have any questions?